time for us to say welcome to Grand SME as we introduce you to another episode of the Unshit Show. And I'm, I'm not going to get over um, how much I love that name. So Grant, hi, welcome. It's good to have you along with us. And uh, you've got a special guest as well today that we're going to be chatting to. So I think I'll hand it over to you and uh, I'll let you introduce him. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, David. And um, yeah, I'm joined today by Mark Ashton. And Mark, welcome to the Unshit Show. Um, again, it's just Thanks, a show. Bro. It's just a show where we talk about entrepreneurship, property investment, and um, really try and get rid of the fluff and the um, the stories around entrepreneurship and property investment, particularly in South Africa, and dig into really the the reality of what it is. So, um, Mark, just if you don't mind sharing a bit of your background, um, and then we can get started. Cool. Thanks, Grant. Very, thanks very much for having me. Um, yeah, so my background is financial journalism. I never really knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, I'm still not totally sure I know what I'm going to be when I've grown up. But um, yeah, my background has primarily been financial journalism. I started out at Succeed Magazine, where I was covering a lot of small businesses and entrepreneurship. Um, and then got headhunted to go to be part of the team that started up Fin24 when it was just rolling out. I um, spent a couple of years there before it was merged with a number of the Media24 assets, including Finweek magazine. Um, and, you know, life was going along swimmingly. And one day we all got hauled into a meeting and we were told uh, Section 189, the Finweek magazine was in, under severe financial strain. Um, and they were looking at closing it down. And did anybody have any suggestions? And from there, myself and Helena Wasserman, who neither of us had ever really had any real involvement in running a magazine before. Uh, stuck our hands up and said, all right, let's give it a go. Um, and we promptly became editor and deputy editor of Finweek magazine for three years. Uh, we learned some very interesting lessons in that, um, particularly coming out of a digital environment and then having to go into a hard copy. Uh, but yeah, so ran that for three years doing a turnaround, which was quite fun. We managed to take it from losing 10 million a year to break even, which we thought was quite a cool achievement. Um, and then got headhunted to go and run MoneyWeb, which at the time was a JSC listed media group. Um, ran MoneyWeb for three years, getting some access to a variety of different media, including radio, uh, video production, uh, content marketing, digital uh, newspaper assets. Uh, and then MoneyWeb got delisted in 2017. And when I left MoneyWeb, I had this idea I was going to start a consulting company that was going to help tackle this challenge of access to finance. Uh, but you very quickly realize that everybody is interested in, in raising finance. Nobody actually qualifies for it. Uh, and we kind of adjusted that consulting company to effectively deal with what we say is the twin challenges of access to finance and then access to markets. So we very much work at this perception that if you're serious about growing a business, clients are ultimately going to be your cheapest form of funding. And so we kind of cut through the BS and say, stop worrying about trying to raise money and let's rather focus on finding you some clients. And yeah, three years down the line, we have a team of five and we have a nice little business. But, you know, we, we, we've had to take a definitely school of hard knocks, but it is fun to be able to deal with entrepreneurs on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I mean, uh, entrepreneurs, I suppose, um, have this uh, attention problem sometimes. So um, it must be sometimes like um, you know, corralling sheep or corralling chickens a little bit, uh, work with all these entrepreneurs looking for funding in particular. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that you very quickly realize is, you know, there's a very romanticized idea of what entrepreneurship and small business is. And I think it's, you know, it's reinforced by a number of stereotypes, both out of the US, out of Israel, um, out of these very capital rich environments who say this is how, you know, entrepreneurship can be done. And even in South Africa, you know, people are very, they have this idea that there's just a whole lot of grant funding out there. And this is how your small business is going to get out the door. Uh, but the reality is the, those that are actually going to qualify for finance, I mean, assuming you're going the legit route, uh, very few of them actually qualify for finance. So they need to actually do the hard yards and put it in. Um, I love the work that I do. I get to deal with fintechs. I get to deal with cannabis businesses, uh, health and beauty, medical technology. It's, it's, it's probably ideal for me. I'm a little bit ADD, but I get to kind of uh, spitball a whole lot of different strategies and, and get to see a whole lot of different entrepreneurs at different kind of parts in their life cycle. And just going back quickly into the media, media 24, Fin, fin Week um, sort of turnaround. I mean, that, that space was very, very difficult. I mean, the last few years have been difficult for, for media companies. But for you to have turned around a company from 20, what, 2014, 2015, um, from, from a loss-making company to break even, that must have been a hell of an experience. 
Yeah, I mean, it was, look, it was, uh, I mean, it comes with some interesting people elements to it, but I mean, effectively, you know, uh, business media in South Africa had gone through, um, you know, tr uh, there was a financial crisis, 2008, 2009, and, you know, financial journalism was certainly the in place to be, and there were some very big salaries floating around in the industry. Um, and, you know, often when you have these big corporates that, that, that have been prepared to throw a lot of money behind these organizations, costs can run away with you very quickly. And, and I think at the time, there were probably four or five journalists, and I remember this was 2014, who were earning over 100,000 rand a month as a financial as financial journalist. And I mean, as a, for a publication that was losing 10 million a year, there, there, there was a certain irony in that you had a, an, a, a publication that theoretically was telling you how to make money, was actually burning money left, right, and center. Um, and it was quite interesting to go through that, I mean, both from personal and professional level. I mean, at a professional level, we got to take a whole lot of young people and give them an opportunity to get their foot in the door in media. And, you know, I, I kind of look 10 years down the line, or kind of 16 years down the line, I can see how far they've come. And I mean, you know, a lot of them were 21 year olds and um, first jobs. And, and it's really cool to be able to look back and see that professional development because they were they kind of grew up in a small business environment but you know at the time I, I didn't have the the kind of corporate hardening to be able to go you know to go through a section 189 process where you know there was retrenchment of some very well established people in the industry uh, having to go and do a lot of um, you know, this interaction with people who were far more senior than me and actually having to make the hard calls and say, look, guys, this isn't sustainable. And you know, they were, we had to make some very unpopular calls. But I think that's probably been quite a good grounding for, you know, some of the, the, the business consulting that we now have to do is to say, actually, you know, every day that the that you sit there burning a big salary the, is a day that the, that the business may not be able to survive. And I think that while it was tough at the time, I think it's given me a very good grounding in terms of what we need to do to, to keep small businesses going. So, so, I mean, you know, we talk about financial crisis, you mentioned 2008, which was, which was a tough one and, and sort of didn't come from anything that happened in South Africa, but we, we know it's the securitization issues. Um, but now we're looking at um, a, a very different financial crisis, one that almost is, is obviously pandemic created, but, but almost being accentuated or, or accelerated by a lot of decisions at, um, at, at a government level. Um, I know that, um, you know, entrepreneurs want to get operating, they want the markets open. Um, there's a lot of businesses that can't operate at the moment. So, I mean, in the space that, that we're doing, looking at the moment, and, and I suppose add to that is entrepreneurs are make, having to make hard decisions like uh, you might have had to fin, fin week is, is retrenchment, unfortunately. And now I'm speaking to people all the time that are going through this retrenchment stage at the moment. And, you know, it's, it's daunting and difficult, but it's actually something that entrepreneurs really need to go through. So there's, a, there's good and bad coming out of the, the current environment at the moment. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I, I remember going up the lift during 2008 and it was kind of high to the crisis at, at the Bidvest building there in Melrose Arch. Um, we were going in for the one of the Bidvest AGMs and one of the Bidvest directors actually said to me, you know, you, you're living through history at the moment. This is going to be... Um, you know, not only is it going to be one of the most disruptive periods of time, but potentially one of the, the, the greatest wealth building opportunities of your lifetime. And I think if you look back, you know, 2008 through to 20, call it 2016, 2017, I mean, that's realistically what we've seen. I mean, we've seen Apple, we've seen Amazon, we've seen Google or Alphabet, if you want them now. You know, you know these organizations have generated significant amounts of wealth, even the likes of your Ubers, Airbnbs, etc. So, you know, even in the midst of a crisis, it does definitely create this opportunity to go and build some very real wealth. And, you know, I think that if you look at what you're experiencing at the moment, you know, a lot of this is very much the same thing. We, you know, we, it was so cool. Actually, yesterday we were out at a restaurant um, and chatting to one of the owners. And, you know, for the first time they had a queue outside their door again. People were suddenly coming out. They were suddenly saying, Flip the world will actually continue. Yes, it may not be business as usual. The fact that this restaurant, which had been, you know, they, they employed, they had 15 people working yesterday, and we'd been to them, in fact, a week before, and they had four people working. You know, you could just see this economy coming, switching back on. And I think it was very kind of heartening from an entrepreneur perspective to go and see those kind of businesses actually starting to switch back on. 
but you know I, I think that if you let the negativity kind of overwhelm you 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 aren't going to get out there and i mean i, I can tell you i, I feel I, I take a lot of pride in the fact that we've managed to create three new jobs under lockdown for three young south africans who have got the opportunity to go and build a little career for themselves and these are talented young people uh, but we mentioned and actually say to them, you know, yes, the lockdown wasn't great. Yes, it's difficult. But, you know, a number of our competitors have fallen by the wayside simply because, you know, the, the, the kind of anchor clients disappeared and we were able to kind of step into the breach. And, you know, in every crisis, there will be opportunities. And I think that we, we, we have to, South Africans have become so good at being pessimists that we've forgotten what it's like to actually be optimists. And I think that we actually need to spend a bit more of our day looking at opportunities instead of finding reasons why things aren't actually going to work. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. I think, um, you know, there's no better opportunity now. And, and even in the next six months, there's going to be assets and, and talk about assets, lots of things that are going to be almost discounted. So there are going to be opportunities to, to create massive wealth. I think I think where where a lot of the problem comes though is is that a lot of people are employed. A lot of people have given control of their financial destiny or financial futures away to other people. So either via their career or or like you say to clients who who sort of dominate their space. So it's it is an interesting one to sort of have these conversations with a lot of entrepreneurs who are really struggling at the moment. And 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 it is harder to be optimistic when you when you can't pay your salaries or or anything else. But but I do agree with you, you know, focus on what you can control versus what you can't. So, and, and, I, and I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of decisions have been made in terms of our economy by, by, by our government. Um, it's everybody's government. So our government that, that we might not necessarily agree with, but if you spend every day, day and weekend focusing on those decisions that they announce on a Sunday evening, you know, you're actually not going to get anywhere in terms of your business. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it, it really is a, I mean, firstly, I mean, just talking about discounted assets, I mean, you know, you can buy technology companies on the JSC for three times earnings at the moment. So, I mean, just the, the, the discount on so many assets out there, I mean, you're in the property sector. I mean, you know, you look at the listed property sector, I mean, it's, it's been absolutely decimated. And yes, some, you know, there, there are some structural reasons for that as well, but there are some seriously good assets out there at the moment. And if you've got the, 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 the kind of determination and the view that actually things will get better, you've got a very good opportunity to actually build some long-term wealth just buying some of these, you know, traditional assets that are out there. Um, you know, yes, I think that there are always going to be challenges in terms of uh, government policy. And, you know, we, we know government has not necessarily been the best um, – you know, has, has struggled to be able to find things that it excels at. I think this is one of the things that probably drives a lot of business owners a little bit kind of crackers is that we're never quite sure about what the policy is around South Africa. One day it's socialist, the next it's a little bit of, you know, capitalism meets socialism. Sometimes it's building industrialists and then we're going to be in the fourth industrial revolution. You know, it, it's very much buzzwords and yet we can't actually look at it and say, this is what South Africa is investing in. Um, you know, like we've been doing some really interesting things in the healthcare space at the moment. And it's one of those areas where South Africa can excel. We've got an excellent public healthcare system. If it was properly capitalized and well looked after, uh, the divide between rich and poor in South Africa, and I think it's been highlighted by COVID, if we can go and invest in that space, we can do some really interesting things. Education sector, uh, you know, it's ripe for kind of um, uh, rebuilding and redeveloping. I think we just need to kind of stop sitting there looking and saying what's well, government's fault. And, you know, yes, we need some strategy. Yes, we need some direction. But, you know, there are opportunities out there. And we have to be kind of uh, drive, the dis drive the discussion, not sit there being a taker of, or, you know, of, of circumstances. Yes. And I think, I think if, if you look at everything, that's really what drives entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is, is really taking control. And you, and you mentioned it earlier, you know, a lot of people will go and move and move away from maybe corporate or having a job into a space where they, they're creating a small business. And those aren't necessarily entrepreneurs. I mean, those, those guys are really people that are creating jobs for themselves or their, for them, themselves and, and their family and really are self-employed. And entrepreneurs are really guys that are, are, are taking full control and full responsibility and accountability for what they're doing to look to to grow a grow something, grow a business and create you know economic prosperity, not only for for the employees and themselves, but also I mean adds into into the country a lot. And that brings me to a question here. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, Grant. I just want to say, I mean, I think that this is one thing that really frustrates a lot of people in this kind of entrepreneurship space 
is we actually have no clue or, or no kind of consistent definition of what an SME is or what an entrepreneur is. Um, you know, government often talks about how we're going to go and create all these small businesses, but a small business is not taking your receptionist who is kind of um, on your permanent payroll and saying, great, now I'm going to put it into an enterprise and supply development program and now they're a call center operator. It's not that they are taking your, your local driver and saying, all right, now we're going to go and repurpose them as a courier company because we're going to get some BE points out of it. You know, we, we actually need to understand what the definition of a small business is. And I mean, I, I don't necessarily know what but you know we often think that survival little survival and small service businesses in south africa are entrepreneurs but the reality is they are just um outsourced contractors that are fulfilling a particular role in south africa yes we need them yes they kind of fit into it but they, they're not necessarily genuine out and out small businesses i mean if you want to go and get into a program like endeavor for instance you know their definition of a small business at, at an entry level is a million dollars of, of turnover. I mean, that's the Microsoft or you know one of the, the tech um, incubators. But you, to do a million dollars a year makes you a small business in South Africa. And you know, it, 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 when you put it in that kind of context, people suddenly realise that you know their little side hustle or their little project is not necessarily a small business in the in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, and I think entrepreneurship, um, you know, also gets muddied by these guys, and and I'm not going to knock all of them, but guys who will go and have a small business, sell it, and write a book about it, and then suddenly they're these these entrepreneurs, and they they would almost, um, you know, add buff and shine to this entrepreneurship journey, and it's just, you know, sometimes really they're living off of their speaking careers and their books versus actually being entrepreneurs, um, which is also sort of adds to the problem. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I think we all know, you know, there, there will be the, there will be talkers and there will be doers. Um, and you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I think if I mean, you and I have done some work together, we know common people in a lot of places. And the reality is that the doers are the people who actually get out there. They go and create things. And yes, they won't always get them right. Um, but you know, I think we we almost reward the wrong things when it comes to entrepreneurship. And I mean, I always remember going and speaking at a conference and, you know, with the media hat on, it's always interesting as well because you get a sense of kind of who's out there, but I always kind of relate two stories that have always stood out for me. Um, I went and spoke at a blogging conference just when it was just starting to take off in South Africa. And, um, you know, the kind of keynote speaker was uh, one of these tech entrepreneurs who uh, he'd just been on the front cover of something like Entrepreneurship Magazine or whatever, and he was kind of lounging over his new Ducati motorcycle. And he, he arrived and we went some, for some drinks afterwards and the bull arrived and he literally said, I cannot pay my you know, I, I can't buy the round of drinks that is, is here. And everyone was, but you're, you know, you're on the front cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. Uh, you've got this fancy Ducati motorcycle. So I haven't got a cent to my name. And, you know, I, I've seen the same thing kind of play out in a number, whether you are in one of the big financial services firms in South Africa, whether you are the kind of poster boy for it, boy or, or, or woman for entrepreneurship this week, people go through ups and downs. Um, and, and very often it's, you know, bullshit baffles brains sometimes. Um, so, you know, always take things with a little bit of, with a pinch of salt and um, don't kind of jump onto the bandwagon of all the success stories, but kind of learn from them and kind of everybody lifts each other up as they go along. Yeah. yeah and, and you'll find also that a lot of it comes off the back of, of um, people being inherently lazy. So, you know, and, and uh, you know, if they, if somebody can show me a shortcut or a secret or a, or, you know, the magic formula to X, Y, Z. And no one wants to hear that the magic formula is work hard, you know, just you know, grind. That's it. So, I mean, yeah. unfortunately, it's just grind. And, and they don't want to hear that. They want to hear the, the and I, I mentioned in, in the first episode, the, the four-hour work week, you know, great line. What a load of nonsense. Yeah, I mean, look, I think there's always ways that we can work smarter. And I mean, like the, the you know, the four-hour work week, if you, you know, like half the time it comes down to processes, you know, uh, you know, we, we, we deal with a lot of tech entrepreneurs and they love building stuff. You know, they, they love nothing better than to kind of theorize about how people are going to use their tech product. But ask them to go and find 10 people who will actually go and use my product or use their product. And suddenly it's like, mm, product's not quite ready for this. Uh, you know, they, they love this build it and they will come theory. But the actual hard grind that comes out there is picking up the phone and saying, hey, will you please try this product? 
Um, and, and this is one of the things where we seem to have carved out a bit of a niche is, you know, we, we've had a couple of these fintechs where we've, we've almost become the kind of business development arm for it. We will go and say, Hey, don't you want to just try this product? Um, and, and this is where I think that the hard work comes into it. You know, there, there's the work we like and the work that we have to do. Um, and I think that as you, you know, yes, you can be visionary and you can do all these fun things, but you know, if you're not going to put any money, you know, you're not going to put users on the table, you're not going to put money in the bank. It's, you know, it doesn't matter how your business goes from uh, on a day to day basis, and how many nice bean bags and selfies you take of your amazing work environment. The reality is that you've got to put the processes in place and you've got to work the kind of the, how do I get my product to market and how do I get somebody to pay me for it? Yeah. Yeah. Because the business is, is like I said, is a set of processes and systems. That's it process and system yep. that generate revenue and and create value ultimately so yep. and if you miss that point you know if you like I say taking selfies in an aston martin that you wish you owned it's not it's not really creating a business it's um creating a fallacy for people so something that that sort of brings me again uh, to the question is is you got this line and and sort of calls is used it loads in in um in the speeches that have been giving of late and, and you hear it a lot of the buzzword and it's this thing called economic growth and economic growth is a great, a really a nice little buzzword, but what ultimately, and, and I sit often and think, you know, what does that actually mean? What, what does that mean the governments are going to do to create economic growth? And I'll, I'll sort, of, sort of frame it here is I went in online and if you jump online and you, you put in um, gold producing countries, um, you know, over the last 50 years. South Africa in the 1970s was the number one gold producing country by a long way, by, you know, multiples. Um, whereas now we're, uh, I think we're fifth or sixth in, in the world in terms of gold production. Now in my head, it says that, you know, I'm not going to point fingers here, but as your gold production declines, you have the ability, you, you create less value for other countries and therefore, you know, the value of your country declines and your economy declines. So, and that's true, ring, will ring true for a lot of things. So can economic growth only be internal or does it have to be in collaboration with other countries? Firstly. So, I mean, you know, we're part of a global economy now. And I mean, you know, if you think about what South Africa, I mean, we, we can talk about mining as kind of, and everyone obsesses about mining in South Africa, but the reality is it makes up, I think, 8% of GDP. It's actually a very small portion of our economy. South Africa is a financial services based economy, and that is banking, insurance, property. That, that, you know, those are effectively the things that make up the majority of what actually happens in South Africa. And the reason that South Africa is, you know, has one of the best stock exchanges in the world, has one of the best banking sectors in the world, is purely because they have to participate at a global standard. Yes, there's you know, an argument that you know, the, 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 the kind of playing fields have always been a little bit protected. You know, to be a new entrant into, the, into a banking sector, for instance, requires a lot of um, you know, some very high hurdles and very high barriers. But the reality is South Africa has, is a financial services economy um, and, and it's super, super concentrated. I think that one of the, you know, maybe the better way to, to kind of frame economic growth is always going to be around economic participation. Um, you know, if you think about youth unemployment in South Africa, it's sitting at nearly 50%. Um, and, and the important thing about that is youth unemployment is defined as 18 through to 35. So, I mean, you can imagine being a 35-year-old South African and never having got into the workforce. Um, it, it's mind-boggling, but one out of two South Africans simply cannot get into the workforce at the moment, and that was pre-COVID. Um, and everyone says, yes, start a business, but how do you start a business if you have no kind of financial capital, no social capital? And, and this is where South Africa, I think, has, is kind of pulls apart. Um, you know, what is the... Uh, I think they say if you earn more than 3,006, well, it's now the national minimum wage, 3,600 a month, you are a, you're effectively considered middle class in South Africa. If you're earning more than 30,000 rand a month, you're considered wealthy in terms of South African context. And that just highlights kind of how low economic participation is once you start looking at the, the makeup of the South African economy. But I mean, economic participation from, from unemployed to employed doesn't mean go and create, um, you know, people who are going to be gardeners or, or you know, uh, guys that are packing shelves in a, in a spa. I mean, that, that's not going to create economic growth. Economic growth is by creation of product adding to GDP, so creation of business at some level. So if we say the youth at the 18 to 35 now, we're trying to get them into the workforce, where, where's the best place to sort of focus on, on pulling them into now? 
So, I mean, I, I think this is a, you know, I think this is one of the kind of structural issues we've been working with in South Africa for a while is, is you know, big corporates are not going to go and recreate these opportunities. I and mean, we do quite a lot of work with the Youth Employment Service, which is the DTIC incentive. Um, and, you know, the, this is one of the things you can see. If you're a net bank and you've got three and a half thousand youth on your YES program, you know, you don't have the ability to absorb them into the banking sector because the the organizations are, are kind of saying, you know, we, we're kept, we, we're not growing, we, we you know, we're, we're trying to kind of optimize our, our resources. So a lot of those youth are then being put into a number of social initiatives, so that would be kind of um, aquaponics, hydroponics, so food security initiatives, health initiatives, so community healthcare work, there was ecotourism pre-COVID. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to capacitate a lot of these kind of community initiatives. Um, and, and this is not kind of the soft and fluffy, but actually capacitating a number of these um, initiatives to be able to say we, you know, we, we know how, how how COVID is ripping through the Eastern Cape at the moment. We need to be able to build awareness of things like diabetes, obesity, etc. Um, the, these are not youth that need to be trained medical professionals, but the ability to share information about things like um, diabetes or COVID can be taught and give these youth some real life uh, work experience to be able to go and work on it. So, I mean, I think there's, there's plenty of opportunities there, um, healthcare kind of technology hubs, that kind of thing. Um, but I agree with you, you know, this kind of expanded public works type program where it's dig a hole, fill a hole, dig a hole, fill a hole is not going to be able to create a, a workforce of the future. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, so we're talking what companies could potentially do to, to create uh, sort of employment or, or opportunities for people. But what can individuals do? You know, we've got property business. Um, what are the things that, that uh, individuals like myself or, or other guys could do to sort of really make a, make a real difference in terms of, and, and not the youth, but I'm really talking about the country and, and growing the country and adding to economic growth ultimately. So, I mean, you know, so if you think about how South Africa is made up, I mean, you, you've got two kind of economic hubs. You've got Eastern, uh, Western Cape and you've got Gauteng. Um, you know, those youth, there's in, if, if you're a BCom graduate, you're probably happy to go and just get your first job at 3,600 a, a month just to get your foot in the door. Um, you know, we, we've got very poor social mobility. So if you kind of live in Tembisa and you want to go and work in Edenville, I mean, in fact, maybe I've got a better example. We've got a youth that works for us. Um, he, he lives in Alberton. Um, uh, Becom Finance, uh, two business qu uh, qualifications from Regenesis, the business, uh, the, the business school. And he was never able to get any work experience. Um, you know, the best he could do was packing uh, um, uh, groceries at, 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 the, uh, at kind of a gig work or temporary environment. Just giving him the opportunity to get some practical work experience. So now he's doing bookkeeping. He's going to venture capital conferences. He's running a little ESD program that we've put together. Suddenly, the, you know, the kid is flourishing. He's got social capital. He's got the ability to get in there. Um, you know, I, I believe very strong, yes, salary is one thing, but it's that social capital that a lot of us take for granted uh, that can make it the difference for a lot of these youth is just to get them some work experience. I mean, I think that for most youth, they can't break into the workforce. They get stuck in this kind of um, cycle. You know, they, they can't get a job because they've got no work experience. They can't get work experience because they can't get a job. And so they just get stuck and, and excluded from the economy. And I think that if we consciously make the decision to, to bring youth into our organizations, uh, even if it's just temporary, even if it's kind of just a accelerator program or a little bit of initiative, the opportunity and the social capital are the things that ultimately get people get their foot in the door. That's awesome. Cool. So um, two things that I sort of went into your profile and, and took a look and, and um, you know, I love some of your Facebook posts. They, they sort of they really cut through, through all the nonsense. But there's two questions I had for you. Who of your career have been major influences in influences in the direction you've taken? Although you, I know you said earlier you haven't really found what you want to do when you grow up, but who during your your sort of maturing phase has been influences or, or really mentors for you um, over the years? Um, you know, I, I think that you you kind of meet different people as you go along. Um, you know, I, I've met. A number of people and across a, a number of different sectors. I mean, Alon Reyes and I have always been in, in kind of regular contact. We got, you know, he, he ultimately got me into that medical technology business we were looking at. Um, but that, you know, that's always been a highly valuable relationship. 
Um, David McKay, he was part of the, the team at, um, he actually gave me the fin twin, my initial fin 24 job. Haley Goodwin, I think you know Haley from, um, uh, you know, they're, they're doing the financial education stuff. Uh, you know, uh, so I, there are a number of people that have come, kind of gone through different iterations, but I think that what I've always admired about them is, you know, they, they genuinely want to go and build things. They, they, they're, they're small business owners. They see the ups and downs. Um, you know, yes, they get a little bit of media profile every now and then, but they don't kind of believe their own bullshit. Um, they, they really do get out there and, and are prepared to put something back into the ecosystem. I think that uh, Sean Riley would be another one. I mean, I, I have immense respect for Sean Riley, who he, he kind of he heads up at Dynamo in South Africa, which is the, the Twitter uh, Spotify ad agency. But I mean, Sean has always been to me one of those people who, who epitomizes entrepreneurship. He, he, he's got a fantastic uh, professional network. He's very well connected with a number of the founders of, of first rand etc but if you ever meet sean sean is without a doubt one of these down-to-earth kind of guys and he's all about selling how do i get out there and go and sell things um how do i go and you know get my get this business idea over the line i'm not interested in the soft and the fluffy i really want this to work um yeah i mean craig gradage he's my financial advisor i mean it's always been interesting to you know discuss with him i mean he he effectively runs a black owned wealth management firm um and just kind of to get the you know, just the dynamic that plays out there trying to break into the financial services sector. I mean, I've always I enjoyed dealing with Craig on a regular basis. So yeah, the number of people that are kind of, uh, you know, kind of coming in and out of life, but you, you get to interact with. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it sounds like, you know, it's not really sort of, I mean, people do certainly look up to, but more peers than, than people that have identified as mentors initially, it's sort of, like I said, you've got respect for them. You've worked with these guys um, and girls and, and, and you've got respect. So they're really peers that have mentored you as they sort of, as you walk in the same journey uh, over time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that you know, they, they've always been prepared to share something. I mean, uh, you know, another one, Arlene Mulder would be another one who, for me, has always been a, you know, she's come out of corporate, but we, whenever you, you need help trying to get hold of somebody, you can always get hold of her and say, you know, I just need help with something. And and, and it's it's that kind of person who I believe adds enormous, you know, they don't kind of hang on to their network. They don't believe that they are more important than they really are. They want to see everybody lifted rather than a situation where it's, um, you know, kind of every every man for himself, and 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 we we all kind of um, you know we we will own this whole value chain. These guys are out there saying, you know, what can I do to put into the, the overall mix? So just just add and create value ultimately. Um, and the, and then the the other one, which is really interesting for me, is, is you you mentioned the, the the medical business and it's um dynamic body technology um, is a business you're involved yep. in there. And then you've got your sort of your funding um, funding and like I say, your the, the consulting business, which works on route to market, which we'll chat about now. Um, but then you also yep. mentioned on one of your posts, um, uh, alternative investments and um, really interesting. Uh, and I, I think it might've been a post from a, a little bit a while back, but May time mm. um, about agri investments. And, and that was quite interesting yep. for me because, you know, from my perspective, I look at, business services businesses and and property that's my space and that's what i really like um but this agri thing has become actually randomly been coming up more and more often um, at the moment and you mentioned food security earlier on that's obviously a big reason why yeah i mean i, I remember a couple of years back one of the you know kind of very loud brash I'm, I'm, his name escapes me but he was one of the kind of u.s market commentators and and he said something which has always stuck with me and he said it'll be the farmers that are going to be driving the lamborghinis and the ferraris it's not going to be the bankers and the lawyers and you know that uh, basically the the kind of messaging he was saying is food security is going to become a major issue food is one of those things it doesn't matter whether you're in a pandemic or a bull market um you are always going to need uh, quality food and you know I, I, I'm never going to run a farm I can promise you that now but you know um, you know, one of the fun things that I do is uh, just um, Fed Group have got this impact investing app where you can go and you can buy beehives and you can buy blueberry blueberry bushes. Um, and I mean, like these things return between eight and fourteen percent per year, um, relatively no risk. Um, and you you basically pay four grand, you get a beehive that'll kind of produce honey for the next five or ten years or whatever it is. You buy these blueberry bushes at three hundred bucks a pop, and they they kind of pay you out between eight 
eight and ten percent a year. I mean, you can't get that on the stock market at the moment. Um, but it's just also it's it's nice to be able to go and do something a little bit different, um, and and kind of feel like you're doing something that has a bit of an agri feel to it. It's not being financialized. It's you know you've got this opportunity to actually just participate in. Um, uh, uh, participating in this particular in, in the agri sector and I mean like these guys from Livestock Wealth are doing some fantastic things now you can buy a, a cow and um, you know for uh, you know for the, for the African community it's uh, the, the opportunity to have a cow for um, for slaughtering purposes you can go and buy ox you can go and buy macadamia nuts i mean all these things now you can go buy on your on, on a phone and i think that's you know these are different asset classes that we don't always know are there but i, mean, I think they're quite cool and it's fun to go and work with them oh yeah, it's, it's um you know and, and this is some underlying asset we understand it and i think um, one of the big problems that you see at the moment is a lot of people pushing cryptocurrency as as one of those uh sort of yeah. new investment, new age investments. And although there's certainly a place or potential for it, um, I think yeah. uh, the, the underlying reason for those assets are yet to, to be clear. Um, so so yeah, I suppose we, everyone talks about utility. Now you understand when you buy a car and it's going to get slaughtered, you understand what the result is. Um, yeah, cryptocurrency, exactly. I'm yet to find somebody who can properly explain to me um, exactly where it's going to be applied. So. Yeah, I mean, I've bought that DCX10, which is the token which lets you buy kind of the equal weighted or the the um, weighted uh, cryptocurrency basket. I mean, I think it's a cool South African innovation. It's done quite nicely. Um, you know, if you don't want to hold things like dollars or pounds or whatever, but I don't understand the space. It's you know, it's it's interesting. You can chuck a few bucks at it and see what happens. But I certainly don't think I'm going to be the next Bitcoin billionaire. I can promise you that. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, Warren Buffett talks about um, investing in things you understand, you know, and he's never invested in, in, a, in a tech company or, or hadn't a few years ago because he just didn't understand the space. But he invested heavily yeah. in Coca-Cola early on and made a lot of money from it. So, so yeah. Oh, I mean, it's as simple as a simple does. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, um, you know, just, just finishing off, thanks for your time and, and, and everything else. And, and I think um, it's important for, for people to understand um, entrepreneurship as, as it is and you're dealing with entrepreneurs all the time. You mentioned finance uh, earlier on um, and financing is one of the problems but then interesting and something that sort of stuck with me that you said earlier on was um, that customers are your cheapest form of, of finance um, ultimately and I think that's very very important and very sort of my, my big takeaway here is you know often even in our business you know eight nine years down the line you're looking for finance or opportunities and if you yeah, finance is great, but if you don't have the customers to back that up, I mean, you're just going to end up in a, in, in a world of pain or debt, potentially. Um, so it's really interesting. And, and I think people obsess about this idea of raising capital. They believe, and and, and they obsess about what they think they're going to get when this, this um, you know, the, the, the fountains open and the money's suddenly going to arrive. But, you know, what when somebody sends you their business plan, invariably the biggest element is always going to be, uh, or some, sorry, let me, whenever somebody sends you a business plan that is, where they, they've never had to go through the finance raising um, kind of lines before, the, the first thing that they sit there and they prioritize is their salary. Um, it's their biggest line item in terms of what this funding is going to be used for. And you say, well, you know, what's the point of this fundraising? Well, it's not to, it's not to employ you. And I think that, that this is kind of one of those switches that a lot of people get wrong is they believe that the funding is supposed to be there to create employment, you know, to fund their employment. And, and while they get their dream out the road, or get their dream on the road, it's not to buy equipment. It's not to go and kind of serve, create some working capital for you. Um, and, and for a lot of people, they get that element of it wrong. And, um, you know, a lot of people also just have really, really poor financial management habits. I mean, I, I'm, I'm no saint when it comes to my financials. We've all run our own small businesses. There are times where you're funding things, um, taking from Peter to Rob Paul and whatever. But the reality is that, you know, when you come along and you say, I, I want 5 million rands worth of funding, but you are sitting with 50 bucks in your bank account, the reality is, and it, th that's a real example. I mean, we had one last week, um, a guy was adamant, he had two, he was looking for 2.8 million rand, and he literally had 300 bucks in his bank account. Um, but if you believed him and you saw his pitch deck, it looked amazing. Um, but the, you know, the, this obsession with raising finance is one of these things that I think a lot of entrepreneurs actually use it as a crutch not to get their business going. Um, and I think a lot of people 
obsess about the finance rather than trying to say, what do we do to put some of the businesses on the, you know, how do I get the business happening and how do I go and find these clients, which ultimately will be the, the kind of um, part for keeping my business sustainable in the long run. That's awesome. So, I mean, I, and I think you, Timmy, you bring up there nicely is, is excuses, excuses for not running a business. If it's not funding, it's uh, timing. If it's COVID, it's uh, the economy, it's the government, it's taxes, it's um, you know, a million other reasons why not to get your business going. And, and actually, funny, I was talking to my wife last night about uh, an idea around, um, you know, if you talk um, science, you talk about potential energy, kinetic energy, and, and what it is. And, and it was, I was saying potential energy is literally um, you've got so many entrepreneurs who are talented, skilled, have brilliant ideas, mm-hmm. but never execute or take action. Those are the guys just sitting with massive potential energy and it just pent up and built up, but it never, nothing ever happens. And then you've got the guys mm-hmm. who maybe aren't as skilled, but they, they're actually doing something. And that builds kinetic, kinetic energy. And over time, that scales up and compounds and actually can become a really good business. And it might not be the best entrepreneur, it might not have the best ideas, but because they're running, um, they're creating this, this, um, these, these sustainable and, and strong businesses. And those are also the guys that, that have seen themselves through COVID, I think, because the guy who was lazy, who didn't structure the business properly, COVID really smashed a lot of guys and, and laid bare a lot of really poor businesses uh, or businesses that weren't really structured or, or managed properly. Um, whereas the yep. guys that were had, getting hands dirty got, have got themselves thus far through it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that this this kind of concept of collaboration is also one of these things that we just, it, you know, often you don't have to go and build everything from scratch. There's plenty of good people out there. I mean, you know, we, we, we've kind of grown to five people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're not making use of freelance skills. We're not kind of tapping into the people inside of our network. That collaboration is the thing that has really, we think, helped us through a very rocky, you know, patch in the economy because disappeared i really want to make sure that these clients are i need to go and partner with somebody to go and kind of give me the credibility and the the weight to get this pro, this, this pro, our projects going and to give us the credibility to make it work awesome brilliant um well mark we've come to to 40 minutes um if i can ask for what one thing just one piece of unshit advice that you can leave with our entrepreneurs and property investors before we go don't romanticize what it, you know, I think this whole romanticism around entrepreneurship is something we actually need to get out of the, um, out of the way. It's not a romantic thing. It is a lot of hard work. It is a lot of hustle, but you know, Alain Reyes always says to me, one of the things that South Africans are really poor at is actually telling people what they do. You know, I, th- I think we often, you know, we, we're so shy and we're so worried about putting our ideas out there. We're worried somebody's going to steal our idea. We're worried something else is going to happen with it. You know, just keep, put your idea out there. Try and build some momentum behind it instead of sitting around waiting for somebody else to do the, to, to do the legwork or run with the idea. So I think that would be my thing. Thing. you know he who dares will put something on the table awesome that's brilliant thank you very much mark appreciate your time today